Good morning. Good morning. So we continue on in our study of Peter. Last week we started with chapter 3. Have you ever wondered why there is six verses um, that are speaking to the wives and only one verse that speaks to the husband? <laughs> that ever crossed your mind? See, those are the things that I would get, but that was also brought out to me, and it's like, hmm. But don't worry, if you turn over to Ephesians, you're going to find even more verses pointing towards the husband, so it kind of makes up for this. But again, why do you think there's six verses that are spoken of to the wife compared to one verse spoken to the husband? The answer to that is that word that she brought out that is likewise. Right? Likewise. What was spoken before that is now to slaves in verse 18, likewise now to wives, you go down, it's now likewise. So everything that you've seen from that point of chapter 2, 18, on to chapter 3, you get down to that one verse to the husband, everything that was written before that is also pointed to him. You guys understand that? Right? So listen, let me ask you a question. Ladies, this is pointed to you. You know, I have been preaching now for probably wow, well, I've been preaching. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't remember. It is almost 20 years, maybe 20 years, maybe that long, two decades. I've never had a man once come to me with a problem of preaching this submission part. Okay? Actually, I've had men come up and say, that was a really good job. <laughs> but hence, six verses to women, one to God. Okay? But now, as many of you know, my father died when I was very young. I never knew him. Uh, he died before I was four. I never knew him at all. So I was raised by, raised by my mother. And in being raised by my mother, I got to live and grow up and see what she had to experience being a woman in a man's world. Because back in the 60s, it was a man's world. I had to see my mother, who made more money than her father, try to get a loan, but they wouldn't give it to her because she was a woman. Unless she had her father, who made less money, co-sign for her. And I realized early on, there is a disparity here. There's something that's just not right. So, when I became a Christian and I started to read the Bible and take it for what it said, and I came to these verses that talked about the submission of women to their husbands. I could understand why that caused such a problem with women. Um, because believe me, over the years I've probably had more conversations with women about this issue. Uh, and not that I started the conversation, but listening to them talk. And understanding that it is a valid, uh, what they talked about, they had a valid reason for talking about it. Because I have seen many men take this uh, word and these scriptures and apply it in a way that the Bible never meant. So why do I go over this again for the second week? Because I want to make sure everyone is clear where I'm coming from. And it's clear on where the Bible is coming from with this. When we look at these verses, and let's go and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. <laughs> Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Why is there so much here spoken of to the wife? Well, I'm glad that Deborah brought out and brought you back to verse 18. Would you rather be a wife having to be submissive to her husband, or would you rather be a slave having to be submissive to your master? Now, in this country, the easiest word is, let me be a wife and let me be submitted because I don't want to be a slave. Okay? And now, understand this. The Bible tells you and gives you clear guidance that if you were a slave, 
that you are to be submissive to your masters, whether they're harsh or whether they're gentle. But what is the reason for that? The reason is found here in verse 1 of chapter 3. That is, so that you can win them to Christ by how you act. Amen. This is very important to understand why there's six verses to women to one verse to a God. Because the precedent has been set, and that is, because of how you act to your unbelieving spouse, they can see Christ in you and come to love Him because of how you love Him. Praise the Lord. Now listen, like I told you, also remember this, that this scripture that is talking about the women is not just for women. Because it was to slaves first, now it's to women, and then it goes to God. The reason why Paul didn't need to write any more than one verse to God is because it's already been said prior to this. So everything that is spoken of here to women, you can put it, turn it right around to guys as well. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. You come to 2015. What does biblical submission look like in a family today? Any ideas? I'm hoping that somebody will say something. A committee decision. Say it out. A committee decision. Now, why would you say a committee decision? Because men take their wives' opinions into consideration. Account, right? So understand that when it talks about submission, it doesn't mean that I am the boss, what I say goes, and you have no opinion and nothing you say matters. That is not what the Bible is talking about here. What the Bible is talking about, and this is why I took you back to in the beginning when God made Adam and Eve, how did he make them? Co-partners, right? Yeah. What was it that God looked down on Adam and said, it's not for what? So when he made a woman, he made her so that she could give the man advice, counsel, help, and balance. So when you come to biblical submission in 2015, what should it look like in a family? I like your definition. That we are co-equal players here. But now, is there hierarchy in God's plan? And the answer to that is yes. You cannot get around that. But as I said last week, this hierarchy is based on submission from every party. The Bible says for the wives to be submissive to the husbands. The Bible says for the husband to be submissive to Christ. And so if the husband is not submissive to Christ, then this biblical pattern will not work. As I said last week as well, there are many families where the husband has nothing to do with the spiritual upbringing of the household. And he has negated his responsibility and his duty. What is the wife to do? In God's point of view, she is to stand up and take that uh, responsibility and to live it out so that in her house she may be the one that is the spiritual leader. Is there anything wrong with that? No. So do you understand that when you read Scripture, listen to me very carefully, there are things that have been written, that were written in a time when the traditions and the customs are totally different than ours today, but the principles are still the same. Right? Now again, I asked you a question. What is biblical submission. What should it look like in 2015 in a family today? I heard one people, one person who was brave enough to speak. Anybody else? There's a lot of married people here. So if it's only one person, this is why this has become such a problem. And it's so misunderstood. Say it loud. 21 of chapter 2. Okay. For even here unto where we ye call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. 
So as a child of Christ and coming into a family structure, a husband and a wife, what should this submission look like? If I am submitted to Christ, then I should love and cherish my wife. And that loving her is loving her fully and completely. Who she is, how she thinks, the value of her opinion, how she looks at the world, and vice versa. The wife should do the same with the husband. That she also should love him, respect his point of view, respect his opinion, respect his leadership, right? But it is a cooperation between husband and wife. Let me ask you a question. As a Christian, whether you're married or whether you're single, what has Christ called you for when you came into His kingdom? Service. Service. Has He not called you to cooperate? This is a word you find extensively throughout the spirit of prophecy. That we are to cooperate with God. That God has chosen us, fallen mortal humans, to cooperate with heavenly agencies in the spreading of the gospel. So if we are to cooperate with God, why was the family set up in the first place? It's set up as an example to the world of how God works who God is, and how His children should operate in the bounds of this world. Mm -hmm. That's what the family structure is for. Hold on for a minute. So when God set this up, and when God gave the guidelines, everything changed after Adam and Eve sinned. Right? And after they sin, there's always this battle for supremacy. Because I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> and you don't like being told what to do. Right? <coughs> but now listen. God calls us into this marriage relationship. Why do you think it's so important that when you get married, you understand what it is you're doing? When I marry young people, that I make sure they understand. Do you know what commitment you're making? Do you know who you're making this commitment to? It's not just to her, but you're making it to God that you will love her and you will love Him all the days of your life. And that you will be there for each other. You will respect each other. And you and your spouse, when the world turns against you, both of you will know at least you have one person who has your back. That's what marriage is. Because that's what God promises you. I will never leave you. Or what? Forsake. Or forsake you. And after the fall of Adam, with the introduction of selfishness within the guidelines of marriage, you either have to find a way to overcome that, or it will overcome you. One way or the other. This is why a marriage outside of the bonds of Christ, they last. But there's so much more that Christ can do for you and in you and with you. Amen? Amen. Right? Yeah. The goal in God's opinion, before the fall or after the fall, is that we fulfill the image of God. And it takes the man and the woman to do so. Yes. In 2015, um, it hasn't changed. No. Okay? Me as a husband and my wife, I am to be a servant leader. Yes. But I am the leader. Okay? And she is the supporter. <coughs> that doesn't mean she always agrees with everything. Mm -hmm. And I find that we screw up when I don't listen to her. <laughs> you know, I do. And I, and but I'm mad enough to admit that. Does that change you making these decisions yeah. without listening to her? Absolutely. I have listened. Because, because that's where the problem comes in. And that's what I see as one of the biggest problems. And that is what you just heard him say. 
a Christian man will say, yes, I understand this and, and submit to Christ. But when it comes to making stupid decisions, we don't learn and we don't listen and we don't submit to our wives. That's what the scripture just tells you, that we are to submit to one another. The Bible tells you plainly that your body is not your own. Husbands, your body is your wives. Wives, your body is your husbands. Submit to each other. You guys know what that means. But there's more to that than just that one act. Right? There is so much more. So, what you have to, and what I have to be plain of, and what you have to understand, especially leaders in this church, is when you get a sermon like this, and when you speak on this topic, that you take into the account the fallen natures of the people that you're talking to. And that there are people who are sitting here today that have had problems with this submission part because of how they had to... Uh, be brought up, and whether it was choices they made, whether it was how they were treated within the family structure, that, and this is both men and women, when you're dealing with somebody who has been told what to do all their lives, who has not had the opportunity to build themselves and know who they are, to be able to make decisions for themselves, and they don't know how to do that. And they just go from one relationship like that to another relationship like that to another relationship like that. That's unhealthy submission. It's not what the Bible is talking about. And that's what I want you to be clear of. Amen. That's not what I'm preaching here. And that's not what God expects. Amen. 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 Because <clears throat> let me tell you something. I have dealt with many people who have suffered abuse all their lives from really high respected Christians. Because they took these verses and mishandled them. If you love your wives and your wives love their husbands and you both love Christ, then there is going to be a cooperation within that family unit. And I'm not going to use my dominance over you to make you something less than what Christ has intended you to be. And you're not going to do the same thing to me. Do you understand? Do you understand why I'm talking about this now? Why it's so important <coughs> to actually go deeper than just the superficial layer that you deal with. So many people, you do not know the backgrounds. Those who suffer abuse try to hide that stuff. Can't hide it forever. It comes out. So what is the responsibility of your church? And that is to teach you the truth and let you realize that biblical submission in 2015 is a beautiful thing. Is your God a God of harshness and abuse? Yeah. Is your God a God of love? Yeah. So if he calls you into a marriage relationship and he has this order within that relationship, shouldn't it be, as Ray said, an order that represents his character? Yeah. Right? But it only works as long as each party submits to who they should submit to. Yes. If I would share, um, it's when I see and know that my husband is spending time with God on his knees and in God's Word that I can believe that God is speaking to me through my husband's opinion, and then I can yield my will to my husband's will because I can believe that he has yielded his will to God's will. Very well said. That's important, right? That's important. So, so basically what you just said is, is when you see that your husband is following the command, then you can respect him. But it says you see it, right? Because there are a lot of people, whether they're in cop, how many of you have ever been pulled over by a cop who's a brand new cop who, you know, looks younger than Wesley? <laughs> and you're wondering, dude, can, can you like even shave once or twice a month? And you know, he's got the gun on his hip and he's got that shiny badge and he just wants to exert his authority. Right? Do you have respect for somebody like that? 
be the same. Before. You do <laughs> until you are out of you know his sight and <laughs> But it's only it's not a respect that you give him because he deserves it. It's a respect only because of the authority that he carries. Right? Same with your boss. Right? It's same with your boss, Marty. In the military we call it respect for the uniform. Yes. Right. And that's exactly what it is. But that's not real respect. Right? When my son was younger, and he was a thug. <laughs> Dressed like a thug, he talked like a thug, he acted like a thug, and he couldn't understand why he kept getting pulled out by the cops. And why they kept frisking him every time they pulled him over. And asked him the same questions. And I found him and I said, come here. And I took him in front of a mirror and said, what do you see? I see me. I said, that's right. And that's what the cop sees. And he sees the thug. And so he has no respect for you, and you have no respect for him. Because that was the biggest thing with my son and all those kids at that age, they wanted respect. They had no idea what respect meant. How do you get respect? Is it something that's just given to you? How do you get it? You earn it, right? You earn it. And so to earn respect, you have to see something in that person that touches you, that shows you, that they deserve your respect, right? Right? What, what have I done to earn God's love? I ain't talking about God's love. I'm talking about in the human form. If I don't know you, you want me to respect you? I'm not going to respect you until I know you. I may show you respect, but you don't have my respect. What does the Bible say? How are we to know whether Christians are true or false? By their fruit. By their fruit. Mm -hmm. As the same principle as what I'm talking about. By their fruits, you will know them. How they act will show you whether you can respect them, whether you can believe them. That's the same thing that happens within a family. How many of you were raised with a domineering mother or father who demanded respect but never did anything to show it? That's what I'm talking about, right? That's One more question. What about Amos? His wife disrespected him horribly. How much more could a woman disrespect a man? And what did Amos do? He went back to her. Why? Hosea. Hosea. Yeah. Now, why? Because God commanded him to. Right. Why? Say this loud. God commanded him to. It was an object lesson. Right. God commanded him to. And so, did he want to do it? No. Would he have done it if God said, hey, make up your own mind? What happened? God commanded him and he submitted to God. Keep that in mind. Okay? So listen, I bring all this out to you again to let you know that when you are dealing with others and you're witnessing to them, you're dealing with people that are broken. And there are people that are broken, and I mean broken. How are you going to show them that God is real? That God cares for them when they have all this baggage that they've been carrying and all this hurt and all this pain and they wonder where God was at when all this was happening. How can I trust you? How can I trust what you say? How can I trust this word? I can trust it if I see in you and how you treat me and how you treat your spouse and how you treat others that what you say is actually true. I can start to see it and then I can start to believe it. Once I believe it, once I am established in it, then I can trust you and I can love you and you don't have to do anything for that because you're already doing it already. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Most of you people, you know each other. But you only know each other, and you may have been in church here for each other for decades, but you know each other on a superficial level. There's nothing wrong with that. Because you only know about me what I choose to share with you. Right? And the bad and the ugly and the painful, I choose not to share with you. Right? Now, it shouldn't be that way. Because a lot of people hold this stuff inside, and it will come out. Through behavior, 
and it will come out. But if I felt comfortable enough to share these things with you, I still wouldn't share with you. That's not who I am. There are those who I have felt comfortable and have shared more than I've ever shared with anybody else. You know what I'm saying? But each one of them, there's just so much more. There's so much more that you keep inside. This is why you have to believe that God is, and God is there, and that God cares. Because that's who knows everything about you. Right? You can't hide it from Him. Pain, suffering, He's there. He holds His arms open, and He wants to comfort you. But you ask, how can a God who you can't see, who you can't hear, who you can't touch, how can he comfort you? <coughs> Look around, because that's where we come into play. Amen. This is what God has called us for. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. So listen. Alright, you ready to go through some scriptures? Alright. So I lay all that again.